Hello, I'm Stephanie Ruff. And I'm Aviva Nabeski. We're the hosts of the Dressage Today podcast, where you can find us talking about anything and everything dressage related. Our conversations span the world of dressage from leading riders to local level dressage heroes. We're talking training advice, showing tips, and sharing stories to inspire your own dressage journey. So tune in, then tack up. Welcome to the Dressage Today podcast, sponsored by Purina. Later, we'll be talking with Mika Mabragana, who won the CDI three-star Grand Prix and Grand Prix Special at Dressage at Devon. But first, I wanted to share a little bit about my trip last week to Raven Hill Farms in New York to film a Stefan Peters clinic. You're so lucky. I am lucky, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> there, there are some good perks. <laughs> tell, us, tell us all about it. What were the highlights? Yeah. No, um, well, first of all, the farm was beautiful. It, it was in a small town or a village. They're, they're called villages there um, of New York called Florida. So I went from the state of Florida up to Florida, New York, um, and the leaves were just starting to change. They're probably at their peak right now, but it was very pretty. Um, they had a beautiful backdrop of the uh, you know, of the trees and everything. So it was lovely. It was a bit cold, particularly for me, but, you know, coming from Florida up there, it was, it was a little chilly. It was, it was a lovely weekend overall. And there were full rides both days. Um, And the main theme, there was, there was one statement that I heard, heard Stefan say numerous times over and over again to everybody both days. It was good, but you can make it better. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So that was kind of the resounding theme. It's it, it became very apparent that understandably so, he is he has an extreme eye to detail and has a very high standard, as you would if you were a five time Olympian. I mean, exactly. you know. Yeah. So um so even in things like the halt, if the hind legs were just a little bit separated. That for me, I would go, well, that's almost square. That's good enough. No, 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 no. Not good enough. Not good enough. We need to be square. If we're going to halt square, we're going to halt square. So I was like, yeah, okay. I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, what is yeah. it they say? The mark of an amateur is they do it until they get it right. And the mark of a professional is they do it until they can't get it wrong. And and that is that you are exact. That is exactly right. And that's yes. Yeah. yeah. Because because and and I always sort of think of these things when when I go to when I watch people like him or like the Laura Graves clinic that I was at or any of these high level Olympic type caliber uh, people that. Yeah, it, they they set the bar so high, and and I, who ride mostly by myself, let myself slide way too much. Yes. So so Nadia always hates it when I come back from these things because then all of a sudden the stuff I've allowed her to get away with is not allowed anymore, and she's like, well, "What the heck? You know, right. you've been letting me do this for you know the last two years. Now all of a sudden I'm not allowed to. No, you're not because I'm setting the bar higher now." Yes. <laughs> so that was you know that was a that was a big thing that you know just to not not accept it okay is not good enough you know he was saying he was saying why do a free walk for us or an extended walk for a six when you can ride for an eight you know Mm -hmm. yeah um so things like that and And he also talked a lot about thinking like the horse and not thinking so much like the rider. Whereas, you know, like he would he would say it's logical that if after you're doing a lot of, you know, maybe flying change work for a horse to have a hard time settling back into a halt because they've done this exciting stuff. So to kind of think about it in that respect and and make sure you're thinking, you know, you you take a look at things from the horse's perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, and, and one of the other things he, he talked about a lot was the, um, that it was, if, if there's a mistake, it's okay. Kind of like we've heard from a number of these people that we've talked to on the podcast and everything that mistakes are okay. Yeah. That's how we learn. 
that's how we learn. And you need, but you need to fix the mistake. You don't make the mistake and go, oh, I messed that up. Okay. Well, you know, maybe, maybe next time I try it, I'll do it better. No, 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 you fix the mistake. Um, but mistakes are okay. And to, uh, to, to ride your training, not like you're in the show ring, you know, so then if something goes wrong, yeah, you can stop, you can do it again. You can, you're not in the show ring all the time. Yeah. You're not constrained by the letters you can. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, those are always good things to remember because we get bogged down. We, we, yeah. we, uh, I think, I think we're, well, I know I can speak for myself in that I'm a little bit of an overthinker. So, yeah, we, we can get a little and I'm guessing there are probably a few other dressage riders out there that overthink things. You think? Um, <laughs> yeah, that, I do think <laughs> so. So that was, you know, that was good. And, the, uh, you know, the other thing I just thought was interesting, particularly for someone who competes at that level, is that, you know, he he feels that collection is secondary. The energy and suppleness are the number one things to do. And um, and that he doesn't typically in his training session, he'll do collected work early before the mm -hmm. horse gets too tired um, and then he'll finish with easier work. Um, and uh, and he spends he said he spends probably 40 to 50 percent of his ride in walk. He feels the walk is extremely important um, and that you can do a whole lot in the walk. And that you know, probably not enough people spend time in the walk. Interesting. So um, those were kind of the big points, I guess. And well, the one other thing that and just like my general observation, because, you know, I pretty much I sit there for two days and take pictures and take notes and, you know, observe because that's what I'm doing. Right. And um, he the, the thing that strikes me about him is he is so very Zen now. That, and that's the only word I can come up with it. He's, he's very, it is, he's very positive and, um, but he's, but he's very, he's very chill. He's very relaxed and you almost can't, you know, it's like, how do you, how are you so competitive when you're this chill now but um he actually talked about it we we had a little gathering after on Saturday after it was after the last ride. Um, and he talked about, and I actually thought it was it was quite good of him. He talked about his struggles with mental health mm -hmm. and um, that he struggled for several years with depression and stuff and um, some severe depression. And that's if you Google that, you'll he's it's documented. He's done some interviews about it and stuff. And he said he has spent a lot of time, you know, working on that and um, and how he has done a lot of meditation and mindfulness and all that sort of thing that has led him to a much better place. He said he was so, so focused on competition that that kind of was that was it that became his world became very, very small. And, um, you know, so he talked about how he has worked very hard at changing that and you can see it because he is, he's very relaxed. He's clearly very happy and he's, um, you know, and, and he's, yeah, he's very Zen. Well, so yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I, so. I think for a lot of people at that, at that level, I mean, when you, when you hit the pinnacle, there's nowhere right. else to go. Right. And then, but then there's the pressure to stay there, stay there. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine, but I can. Right. Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We, we will not be in that position, but you know, yeah. we can't, we can imagine that sort of, yeah. What else do you, where else do you have to go? But down quite frankly, you know, in yeah. a lot of ways, like yeah. or the struggle to stay there, like I've yeah. gotten here, how do I stay here? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I thought that was very interesting, but he's, he's quite charming and, um, just very, very positive, but at the same time, very like, no, it's, you can, you can do this the right way. You know, you can do it yeah. right. You can do it better. Was um, there one horse rider combination that stood out for you? There were, 
They were all, you know, most of the rides were upper level for the most part, which is understandable. And um, the, I mean, generally speaking, the horses and riders were all quite lovely. And I actually honestly don't remember everybody's names, so I can't name one that <laughs> just wonder. Yeah. Um, but the the quality of the horses and riders was very, very nice, you know, across the yeah. board. So um and you know, they were and that is but that was maybe the one thing as an auditor, they were all almost all with the exception of maybe one or two they were all upper level riders and horse combinations right. so a lot of the same exercises were going on which is understandable yeah and um but you didn't see a huge variety in you know in exercises and different things because the horses were generally speaking you know above third level yeah. Um, so it was just a varying matter of degrees. Uh, mm-hmm. But there was one pretty hot. Uh, there was a mare there that she was kind of hot and spicy. And she reminded me, well, she was better trained than Nadia, but she reminded me of Nadia's attitudes and stuff. So that's where I, you know, I took some very helpful hints from that. I'm like, oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. I see it. I see it. OK. So, yeah, poor Nadia. I, I feel for her now. Yeah. <laughs> she hates it when i do this to her it's okay it's, <laughs> how long does it last <laughs> stop it i'm trying to make it last longer okay <laughs> this month's ask the owl question comes from bobby what do you wish you saw more of as a judge And in turn, what do you wish you saw less of as a judge? It's a super question. That's a really kind of overarching, open kind of question, though. Well, yes, it is. Definitely. So I can give you the really, you know, easy, easy peasy answer, which is I want to see horses. um, What I want to see are horses that are going freely forward, back to front rather than front to back. And, you know, meeting the 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 requirements of the level and I want to see accuracy Um, and what I don't want to see is horses that are pulled into a frame and horses that are creeping along at you know snail speed and riders who are ugly and yankee and pulling but that's what everybody wants to see right right Um, yeah definitely right Um, exactly my my real feel when I when I read this question for the first time was what I really would like to see more of in the show ring um, is more of a sense of sportsmanship. Um, I would like to see more of when somebody comes out of the ring that, you know, the rider that's waiting to go in next says, oh, that was a lovely leg yield, you know, or, hey, what a nice test, congratulations. And that when the person coming out of the ring sees the one coming in, they say, you know, good luck, have a great ride. And that when somebody comes out of the ring and goes to their coach, that the first thing that the coach says is, I'm proud of you and not what happened there. You know, that we're, that we're all bolstering one another, that we're all supporting one another on this journey that we're, you know, showing is hard. Yeah. You know, and I mean, how, I mean, we're, we're, we're being quote judged you know i mean there's a like, literally literally yeah you know and it's not just you know oh that was nice but you know every single movement is it has a judgment cast on it yeah um and that's so hard for us and you know going back to something that we've talked about so many times why do we ride and recapturing you know the joy of horses and recapturing the joy of riding and you know i i, I know that i show because i'm competitive and I like the ribbons. Um, and I, you know, I admit that we all do it. Otherwise, yeah. we wouldn't know. Right. Um, I also show because for me, it's really important to have some kind of a goal to be moving towards, you know, and even when I'm not showing, I'm thinking about what's, you know, what's in the next level? Where should I be moving in my training? You know, and, you know, I was even talking to my trainer just this week about doing some clinics, just not because I don't trust my my trainer as you know knowing everything but just getting another set of eyes on me to say hey you know maybe look at this right you know because we all get a little stale when we see one another over and over and over again 
So, I mean, there's a reason that we show, but it's also supposed to be fun. And it's also, for me, what I want to see is a rider who comes in and is proud of her horse. Yeah. You know, I see so many riders who are cowed by the whole concept of showing. And I would like to see a rider come down. I had a trainer who used to say to me, come down center line like you're the queen entering a room. Chin up, chest up, Mm -hmm. proud. You know, for, for each one of us, every single person in the ring believes that her horse is the best horse in the whole wide world, right? I mean, Gandhi yep. is the best horse in the world, right? She is. I love her yeah. dearly. Yeah. And Leo is the best horse in the world. And Tiger is the best horse in the world. Right. And yeah, maybe they have things that are difficult about them. And, and maybe they're not Vallegro. Um, <laughs> to us, they're the best horse in the world. And yeah. what I love is when a rider comes in and you can tell they love their horse. Right. And that horse is the best horse in the world. And they can't wait to show me, their judge, how cool their horse really is. And at the end of the test, when I see the rider put both reins in one hand and salute and then pat their horse, that gives me so much joy. Yeah. I even love the, the riders who forget to salute me and, and just pat the horse. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, that's sort of a salute, so I count it. And it, <laughs> it makes me smile. I love to see the riders who are smiling throughout the test. And when their horses make a mistake or do something, sometimes you hear a little chuckle. Oh, yeah, that's me. That's me. I, 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 I laugh because if I don't, I'll cry. No. Yeah. <laughs> but so so that's that's what I look for. I'm looking for I'm looking for joy. I'm looking for harmony. I'm looking for us supporting one another. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I love when. I'm, I'm being a rail bird and somebody has a horrible test, you know, and they come out and, and, and they're told you handled that so well. Yeah. You know, as opposed to why didn't you? Right. You know, and, and I, and, and make it a positive instead of a negative when, when a rider beats you and you don't say, well, you know, your horse is older. Or, you know, well, if I had big, fancy, warm blood, I would have gotten a 70. But just courageously right. say, hey, congratulations. That was a beautiful ride. Yeah. So, Bobby, that's my answer. You know, all the little nuts and bolts in the ring, but then the things that come on outside the ring. Those Do you the see much I poor sportsmanship? Um, I don't see as much now as I used to. Oh, good. I, okay, good. I, we're getting better. Good. Um, but what I still do see, and remember, I'm an, I'm a grad of the L program. I'm I'm right. not technically a licensed judge, so I judge schooling shows, and we get to talk to people. Right. Um, and what what I what I'm seeing more of now than I used to is riders taking the responsibility for the mistakes on themselves. Oh. What I used to hear a lot of right. Um, you know, well, my horse did, yeah. or, you know, whatever. I also really hate the, well, we can do it at home. We're much better at home. Well, of course you are. We're all better at home. Yep. <laughs> you know, I know that. That's what, the, that's what the show is all about. It's finding out where the holes are. So don't tell yeah. me you're at home, you know, and, and don't tell me, well, you know, he, we, we, you know, something bad happened on the way here or, you know, whatever. It's, it's about, you know, don't don't make excuses. You know, tell me that your horse is the best horse in the world. Right. So, yeah, I think there's better sportsmanship, but I think okay, good. it will always be better. Well, sure. Yeah. But but I'm I'm glad to hear that things are uh, things are definitely better. Of course, it may also be that people know that I, I give them the stink eye when they say stuff like that. <laughs> and, now, and now they're just faking it with me. Who knows? <laughs> But I just I one of the things that I love about showing is when you go to a show and you meet somebody that you didn't know before and maybe you're even competing against them and they beat you and you can still be friends and you can still be happy for one another and you can support one another. I've I've met some wonderful people at short horse shows who have become my friends long term. Um my my wonderful friend Phoebe DeVoe, I met at a horse show and we were stabled together and we just kind of hit it off and I liked her. And so I went and I watched her compete and 
you know, we've been friends ever since then. And she supported me going through the L program and she's the one who sold me Leo. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that can happen at, at a right. show. That's, you know, I don't see that as the judge sitting at sea, but I think that creating that kind of a positive supportive environment comes through in the ring as well. That I think is an excellent answer. I'm glad to hear that sportsmanship is at least alive and well <laughs> to a point. And um, we need we need more questions. We need more questions for you, Aviva. Okay. So if anybody out there has a question about training or showing that you would like to pose to Aviva, please uh, email me or reach out to us on social media. The PhD equine nutritionists at Purina Animal Nutrition tackle problems using science, and their love of horses keeps them at it until they get it right. Even with the most established feeds, they keep innovating. Even when it takes years of research, they don't stop until it's right. They are dedicated to the scientific method, but it can't capture the feeling of seeing a horse reach its full potential. It takes science and love to help your horses live their best life, Put their research to the test at horseinnovation.com. Mika Mabragana was born in 1986 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. In 2000, at the young age of 13, she was on the team representing Argentina at the Northeast Junior Young Rider Dressage Championships, which is now called London's Youth Dressage Festival. She moved to the United States in 2005 to be a working student and assistant trainer for Lyndon Gray. Since that time, she has become a USDF bronze, silver, and gold medalist and a USDF certified instructor through fourth level. She currently runs her own training business in Bedford, New York and Wellington, Florida. Mika, I want to thank you for joining us today and taking some time to talk with us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. Well, to, to start with, um, in case people don't know, they might not be so familiar with you. You are from Argentina. And so could you tell us a little bit about what it was like to grow up there? Um, yes, I actually grew up with horses because when I was young, we had a farm and I was always in love with with horses I was riding since I was very little, but it wasn't in any sort of discipline. It was just riding out in the field and, you know, going on long trail rides and that kind of riding. And when I was 11 years old, my parents had to sell our farm. So we went to live in the city again full time. And that's when I started riding in in a riding club, in a pony club, actually. <laughs> so they have pony club in Argentina? Yes, but it's oh. not like, it's not like here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> educational. It's just riding ponies. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Okay. So then can you tell us a little bit about your journey to the United States and how that all got started? Yeah, since I was in the in a riding club, you know, we did we did dressage, we did a little jumping, we did pony games. It was very, you know, um, multidiscipline. Um, mm -hmm. And that's when in 2000, um, Landon Gray invited a team of kids to come to compete at the at her show. At the at that point, it was called Northeast junior young writer championship some, something longer <laughs> that's what it is <laughs> London show <laughs> and so anyways that's um when I got selected um uh, to come and represent Argentina with the team and that's when I met London I got more introduced to what dressage was about um at that point she had uh, Courtney King working for her as a working student. So it was very inspiring to see, you know, that there were those kind of possibilities here that if you could, you know, exchange work for writing. And <laughs> <laughs> that was a little of a, you know, foreign concept, uh, you know, 
in Argentina. So I got really, you know, motivated when when I saw that and 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 the kind of lifestyle they had. I, you know, the moment I saw it, I was like, oh, I want to do that. <laughs> yeah. When you came, did you bring your own ponies or did you ride the horses that were here in this country? Oh, oh. London provided us with she horses. Provided. Yeah. Okay. She would find horses for the teams. Um, so, yeah, we, we didn't have to bring our own horses. When did you when did you come here to work full time for London? Uh, well, first I did um, a three month period on my school break. I was 16. It was my last year of high school. So I was mm -hmm. here for three months in the winter and uh, just to try it out. And I actually was really homesick. I, I didn't enjoy <laughs> my first month at all. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, then you, you learn the routine. You, you start to get, you know, you're part of a team so that those feelings of homesick go away. Um, and so I came back when I finished high school. I was 17 or 18. Um, and that's, I've been here ever since. <laughs> It must have been different for you to go from the environment at home to being a working student for London in New England or, you know, the mid-Atlantic. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole the whole thing was like a cultural shock for me because, yeah. you know, it, I was living in the city. I had, um, you know, a lot of independence because I could move with, you know, with the bus, with the train, whatever, you know, it, it was a much different, much more different lifestyle. And to move from there to, you know, Bedford, New York, where <laughs> if you don't have a car, you, you can't go anywhere. <laughs> um, it was definitely a shock. And of course, I came in the middle of the winter and I've never yeah. seen snow before. So. Oh my. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was definitely a shock at first. And, you know, back then we didn't have computers or cell phones. So I had to buy, you know, these cards to call home and, right. you know, all my savings went on like calling home, you know, each yeah. card was like $20 and you had to dial 30 numbers to call home. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those days. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was like, it's not like now that you have like, Oh, you, WhatsApp or whatever. You're yeah. so easily. And if I wanted to use the internet, somebody had to drive me to the library and then I could yeah. use the internet for half hour, you know? And so it was, it was definitely, it had its challenges. Um, and again, I never lived by myself. I was, you know, I had my family back at home. So right. again, having to take care of what are you going to eat today? And, you know, are you going to do your laundry? <laughs> you know, just regular things that you don't, take into consideration until you have to, you know, deal with them. <laughs> well, so you, sure. Yeah. You, you did a lot of growing up pretty fast then, huh? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you're living with London, so the growing up happens like in half a second. <laughs> <laughs> because one day I left, like, I think a fork and a plate on the dish, like, I didn't clean it I just left it on the sink and oh my god like that was the last time I did that so yeah so you had but, to get with the program pretty quickly okay but clearly you did because you stayed with her for quite a few years yeah yes I mean once you knew like what the standard was you could you, you could carry on you could do a good job you know um but yeah, I was with Lennon for, yeah, for almost six years. Um, what was it like? Well, it was definitely um, a, a period in my life that I cherish very much because it was nothing but great opportunities, um, a great team to work with, um, I, I, yeah, again, like a lot of opportunities that wouldn't have happened if, if it wasn't for London and her generosity and her 
ability to give you these things, you know. Right. She, she yeah. had a farm with uh, 50 horses or more. And <laughs> when I came, I wasn't, she wasn't riding anymore. So we did get a lot of riding opportunities um, as working students. How wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think she was in a position that, uh, you know, we were very lucky yeah. to to be able to to learn in a, in that kind of in that kind of environment and, and with so many opportunities. Yeah. Did you ride all made horses, or were you working on training young horses, or a mixture of both? Well, um, when I arrived, Lennon had a you know most of the horses were owned by um, adult amateur clients. So mm-hmm. most of the horses, I would say, ninety five percent of the horses were had some sort of training already. We weren't doing a lot of breaking in or or having really young horses. You know, once mm-hmm. in a while, like three or four year olds, five year olds would come along, but most of them were already somewhat educated. Okay. Um, so yes, I, I think if I have to look back and say what was missing in that period, it's like, you know, maybe learning uh, more about the young horses and and breaking them in and backing them up. We, we right. didn't have a lot of exposure to that. Yeah. Yeah. In addition to riding where you were responsible for things like mucking and cleaning tack and turning out and all of that, or did she have staff for that? Uh, Well, in my times, we weren't cleaning stalls, but we did have like, we were in charge of a barn. So we did the feeding, the turning out, the cleaning. Um, Like you were in charge of like making sure everything was, you know, clean and organized and functioning. in that barn. I mean, obviously you had to be aware of the entire farm, but we had, we each have like a barn that we were in charge of. Right. Um, So you learned how to, how to run an equine business really, in addition to the riding. That's awesome. Yeah. We did a lot of, um, you know, other things other than, and other than riding and, Mm -hmm. And she did give us, you know, a lot of responsibility <laughs> right off the bat, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like you you have to do this and you have to do it well, you know. And Right. So you're going to make it or you're not going to make it. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, obviously, there was a manager above us that, over- right. had, you know, it's not that we included people <laughs> were in charge. <laughs> no. <laughs> but you know, you, yes, you 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 were handed a lot of responsibility, and you were expected to you know to do a good job, right? Um, what advice would you give to young riders or young professionals that are trying to get established um, these days in in the dressage industry? Um, I think my biggest advice is not to become a professional too early or too soon, because um, once you start running a business, it's very difficult to carry on with your own education. And um, I think it's very easy here to, you know, do well at the young rider, do well at the small tour. And then all of a sudden you think you're a trainer. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And that's not really the case. I think I would recommend any young up and coming person to go spend some time abroad or to go spend some time with another trainer uh, here in the u s there are obviously a lot of good trainers um and just spend a little bit more edu- more time educating themselves right um, it's great that- advice. That would be my my biggest advice because I started my business kind of like one thing led to another and all of a sudden I'm a, I'm a young professional. And of course, I don't have any regrets looking back, but yeah. maybe I should have gone to like, you know, you know, you go to college and then you go to the next thing, you know, instead of just you're, you don't become a doctor right away. <laughs> Right, yeah. right. Out of college, you know, you yeah. do your PhD, and then you need <laughs> something else. So, 
Yeah. That's what I would recommend. No, I think that's very good advice. Yeah. And um, shifting gears just a little bit, you yeah. did just win Dressage at Devon CDI three star, the Grand Prix and the Grand Prix special with the horse Diamond Rosso. So was this your first trip to Devon or have you competed there before? I had competed there as a young rider in 2006 and 2007. And then I think in 2008, I went back and did the fourth level class with another horse. But yeah, I hadn't been there in so many years. I was really looking forward to to going back because it's such a great show. And it's changed a lot, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I remember in, when when I was there as a young writer, you know, all the national classes that are available now were not really available then. Right. And the All of the classes, the young writer, the Grand Prix, the small tour, they were much, much bigger at that point. Um, mm-hmm. But it's still a great show. And I hope it, you know, grows again as as I remember it. Yeah. Well, could you tell us a little bit about Diamond Rosso? Yes, Diamond Rosso, he's magnificent. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I actually started riding him in 2019, and it all happened, like everything in my life with horses (laughs) kind of happened by serendipity, if that's the right term for this. Yeah. Um, because I was at another barn um, teaching, um, you know, a few times a week. I stayed back in a winter. I didn't go to Florida. And I was, you know, doing a lot of teaching around different barns. And the the owner of Diamond Rumso, actually, I knew her from um, the London's time because she was a working student at one point, I, when I first arrived, she was already on her way out of being a working student. But anyways, we kind of reconnected um, through this other person that wanted lessons. And and I started giving Maria Elena a few lessons a week. And then she was, she went on vacation and I started writing Rosso a little bit. And then all of a sudden she realized that we were a very good match and out of the blue was like, why don't you keep riding him and why don't you become his rider now? And I was like, oh, oh really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like when I first started working with her, the first thing, you know, she kind of made clear is that, you know, she wanted to ride her horse, you know, and mm-hmm. it's like, of course, I right. understand. So I never knew it would, I never thought it would turn into the partnership we have now. Wow. Um, uh, so what are some of your future goals, either with him or, or just in general? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that we can do the CDIs in Wellington this season and mm-hmm. get him qualified for the Panam Games. and. Um, you know, maybe other things in the future, but that's <laughs> our our most um, how do you say tangible goal, <laughs> right? Point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you would, of course, if if all things you know come to fruition, if you were to go to the Pan Am Games, you would compete for Argentina, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And um, I, I still write for Argentina. Right. I think I, I will always write for Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other upcoming horses besides Rosso? I actually have a very cool six-year-old Lusitano um, that I I acquired in February. And oh. He's, I don't know, he was born knowing things. <laughs> 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 it's pretty cool to to ride him but um i've only competed him once just to see how he would behave at the shows and of course yeah. he was perfect um but now we're taking the time to just focus on um developing him and not doing a lot of a lot of showing yeah 
So you won't see him for a while. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, beyond the horse world, what do you, are there things you like to do? Ways you like to get away from the horses? Yeah, I, I saw that question. And I was like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> is there a life without horses? Is, is there? Yeah. yeah, I'm like, what is that? What is that? Uh, okay, well, that's an answer. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I I had like a lot of a lot of hobbies outside of horses, but I, I don't. I you know, I like to spend time with my dogs and go, you know. Um, hiking with them and just you know dinner with friends right but nothing nothing crazy i'm i'm a little bit of a homebody so um, what kind of dogs do you have well i have a labrador pitbull mix then i have a pitbull mix with who knows what <laughs> and now i have a third dog that it's also some sort of terrier mix so I have a I have a good a good um gang with me. Good. <laughs> nice. Good. Well, and the last question that we like to ask everyone to get their perspective is what do you think makes a great horse person? Hmm. I think is putting the horse first. I think is you know, not allowing your goals and dreams to come, you know, prior than the horse. I think a good horse person will always have the the horse's well-being in their mind. And I think spending time with your horse and, and really knowing what is, you know, what they are. Not just, you know, competing and moving on, but really knowing all their aspects, you know, how they are in the stall, like how do they poop? How do they drink? You know, like all that kind of thing. Why are they moving the lip like that? Are they, you know, just the small details of really right. knowing um, your your horse that only comes by spending time with them. It's a great answer. Yep. We we approve of that answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I just want to thank you again for um, talking with us today and getting to know you a little bit better. And I'm sure I can speak for Aviva when we wish you the best of luck this winter in Wellington. Absolutely. We'll be keeping an eye on you. <laughs> thank you so much. And again, thank you for, you know, Selecting me for this, it, 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 it's a really real honor. Thanks for listening to the Dressage Today podcast. If you've missed any episodes or to subscribe, go to Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. While you're there, please rate and review the show. Learn more and read in-depth training articles at dressagetoday.com, or you can visit our subscription video site ondemand.dressagetoday.com. Be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. Happy riding, and we'll see you at X. The Dressage Today podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of Equine Network, LLC.